it's interesting, right? Like entrepreneurship rewards pathological overconfidence because you've got to be a little crazy. You got to be a little tr crazy to try, right? The game of building a business and you know trying to trying to build wealth that way is taking a lot of shots, kind of an insane amount of shots on goal, and then just continuing to have that confidence that the next one is going to work, staying in the game for long enough that like eventually the strategy pays off and you kind of win. So that's a like the, the realm of self-employment and entrepreneurship is a pretty unique environment in that it rewards that overconfidence and that bullheaded, <laughs> like, I'm just going to keep trying, right? Whereas almost everywhere else in life, that strategy doesn't work <laughs> out so well. So, you know, if you want to look at like what's wrong with entrepreneurs, one thing you can look at is like, they're, they're building this muscle memory for this particular skill set that works great in being in, in, an, in a business, but when you translate it into other settings, yeah. it starts to get a little bit weird. So delusion kind of is like, could be good for building a business, but delusion might not be good in other parts of your life, exactly. specifically your finances. Exactly. Peter, I have a question. Did, do you, is, it, is it entrepreneurs, do they think they're overconfident? Or to me, as an entrepreneur, I just think it's just common sense what we do. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think it depends, right? There's different there's different types of there's different types of entrepreneurship. And um, I think that we can separate out the like, here's a way that I think about here's a way that I kind of sort entrepreneurs. I think that there's people who are self employed who build a business where there's some aspect of trading their time for money, right? And the reality is that for most Americans, this is the primary vehicle of wealth creation. Like if you look at who's getting rich in America in 2024, it's dentists, it's doctors, it's, it's service, you know, people who are providing a service and selling their time for lots of money and building a business that way. I think that there's a very different risk profile for those folks versus the people who are out there trying to build something bigger than themselves, something based on innovation, maybe based on technology, where they're trying to right. figure out a way to make money while they sleep by building some sort of machine that they can solely work on versus be some, somebody who works inside of. And so that type of entrepreneurship has a totally different risk profile. Kind of like the Elon Musk effect, right? The, right. the Elon Musk type entrepreneur versus maybe like the more mom and pop shop that's running some sort of service business. Right. And I think that like our our uh, our culture has glorified that latter type of entrepreneurship, right? Ever since maybe the social network came out, which has got to be like a decade ago or whatever, there's been this big cultural shift where, you know, young people like no longer want to drop out of school and become rock stars. They want to drop <laughs> out of school and become startup founders. They want to be Sean Parker, the guy who built the uh, built Napster, the software platform that all the rock stars uh, had their music hosted on, right? Like that's now the, the dream. And that, I think that is when people step into that arena, that if they're going to succeed or even really try, right. And, and survive for a little while building startups, like playing that game, they do develop this very different relationship with confidence, with risk, um, that makes them, you know, pretty different to the average human being in terms of how they think about like, yeah, confidence and, I don't know. Some of those, some of those business ideas are not common sense. And uh, <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. Those latter type of entrepreneurs, they, they never really retire, right? They're always refining, redefining, acquiring, starting, you know, they're like serial entrepreneurs, right? Do they just, they, they just go until they're not here any longer. Is that pretty much the case? Yeah. I mean, I think that they're those types of businesses, uh, like they're, these are people who are pursuing the big asymmetric returns, right? Where they're trying to work on an idea that hits that kind of inflection effect, produces that hockey stick growth. And one of the things I see, having worked with a bunch of these people who, who do this, who have a big win, is that it is pretty addictive. And even when there's an opportunity at the end of that journey, you know, there's maybe a liquidity event where they could take some chips off the table and walk away home <laughs> and walk away and go home. There is this incredible... There's this incredible kind of psychological pull to like, but let's let's make another bet. Like, what if we what sure. if we go all in? And I, I mean, I know like I know several entrepreneurs who I've worked with several who have literally turned around and done that. Right? They've been like, let's let's start it again and this time go bigger. Let's go do another venture capital backed like huge thing and maybe invest a lot of the proceeds of their their last venture into right. that new thing. I mean, it's kind of like you know, Musk took all his proceeds from PayPal, right, and put it all into Tesla all into SpaceX. Yeah. Um, I, I guess the question is, I mean, Elon Musk is one person who's probably done it on such a huge scale. 
against all the odds, but for a lot of the people that you work with, do you find that a lot of times when they plow everything into the next venture, it's not always so successful and they regret not putting some chips to the side and maybe off the table? Like, have you seen those horror stories? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's survivorship bias, right? Like the, the media glorifies these stories, like people like Elon Musk. And, who have actually done it. Yeah, who have done it. Yeah. But I think if you look at like 7 billion people on earth and just the statistics of entrepreneurship in general, the millions, hundreds of millions of potential business owners out there, that environment statistically is gonna produce a couple of outliers who are the people who have a big win, then bet it all on black and go in. Like, I mean, betting it all on like a space project and coming up and like winning that bet <laughs> like what are the what do you know what are the odds of that and you know we could we could we could go down a rabbit hole and talk about what we think about elon but just taking the personality out of it objectively taking a fintech startup that wins and then doubling down putting it all on black but black is a space company right, is right. objectively yeah, 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 right. is objectively it's insane. insane yeah it's objectively <laughs> insane and so what we don't talk about are uh, the like the the sort of littered the littered corpses and history of the entrepreneurs who made these types of moves maybe on a smaller local scale where they doubled down you know maybe somebody was a successful restaurateur with one property built it up and sold it right like a right. successful restaurant and then was like i'm gonna go all in and do it do something bigger and then the second thing went absolutely bust and they lost it all and i think history is filled with those types of stories um and and it's driven by you know, the, the, the entre entrepreneurs who build these types of businesses get taught a lesson, which is, oh, my crazy self-confidence actually paid off. And what they don't understand is that they are, they are living down one particular timeline in the kind of quantum mechanics of history. Yes. But there were all of these other timelines where they actually didn't win. And so they don't realize that even though they're successful, they need to do a risk adjustment on that success, right? Because you start to believe your own BS. It's almost like we talk, we have this saying, don't confuse brains with the bull market, right? right? When the market's going up and the wind's at your back, it's not necessarily because you're smart. And the other thing that I like is, you know, I'd rather be lucky than good. And let's face it, you know, there is some luck when you hit a home run, whether it's an entrepreneurial venture, whether it's picking a stock that all of a sudden, you know, goes up uh, magnitudes uh, from where you bought it. A lot of times what happens is I find in our business, is people start to believe their own, you know, for lack of a better word, bullshit. Well, and and in my world, like in the in the venture capital back tech startup world, there's it's not just that you're believing yourself, right? It's also that the environment starts to echo back these false signals of confidence. So if you build a successful startup as a as a venture capital backed kind of tech founder, and there's VCs who back you, and they win, you win, right? Yeah. The very next thing that happens is you get VCs hitting your call like spam, uh, hitting your phone like spam, right. trying to throw money at you to do it again, right? And so that has a psychological effect on someone. Like if you're, if you're sitting there with a well-adjusted outlook going, hey, there's a, there's a healthy bit of luck in this venture I just built and sold and it was a success. And it was, I was also really smart and I executed while the team <laughs> right. was great, but yeah. we, got, we also got lucky, which is, which is I think a good, that's a well-adjusted worldview, right? But then every day you're getting calls from VCs that previously wouldn't give you the time of day who are now like, what are you doing next? How much money do you want? Can we get first check in? What do you need? Like, here are the, here's my Rolodex, let's go. Eventually that starts to have a psychological effect. It starts to distort yeah. your perspective of reality, your perspective of yourself. And you start to go, maybe they're right. Maybe I am a genius, <laughs> right? Like, and I, I've seen so many people yeah. go down this path and it's very easy to go, I, it's just a hop, skip and a jump from maybe they're right. Maybe I am a genius. Why would I take their money when I could be my own? I could be my own preferred shareholder. I could inv I could put my own cash into this thing. And then you get an entrepreneur who's yoloing into a new venture without taking chips off the table. Wild. You know, Peter, I see that a lot in, uh, in real estate development, right? You get a real estate developer hits a home run and they don't see that the cycle's ending. Um, and they go to the, the bank with a big proposal and a bigger project and the bank says, well, wow, that's uh, that's Chris Payne. He's a genius real estate developer. You know, this thing doesn't make any sense, but, you know, he's a genius, so it must be right. And then the, the genius real estate developer walks out of the banking office saying, well, they're the biggest bank in the world and they're endorsing my project. They must be right. You know, and even though I think this is a crazy idea. So it's I think a lot of time there's a lot of bluffing going on between the uh, the lender and the 
and the developer. Yeah, and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of kidding each other at the at those tail ends of like the bubble part of the market, right? Like I see that right. in the VC world as well, where like the VCs are like, you know, like we need we need good places to deploy capital, so like we can trust these serial founders who have built successful businesses before, and that they've got this insecurity of like, what if all the good deals are done? What if like software is no longer eating the world, right? Like that's what it's like to be inside of the VC of where am I going to allocate this capital? These LPs want returns, and I'm just not sure there's good deals out of there uh, out here. And yeah. then the, and then they're meeting these entrepreneurs who are you know maybe have proven, maybe have built something, and those guys privately are thinking, do I really have another one in me? Man, I got pretty lucky last time. <laughs> But these inner dialogues aren't present at the coffee date. <laughs> at the right. coffee date, yeah. the entrepreneur's like, I got some huge ideas, bro. And the VCs are like, we believe in you and we've got the capital to do it. And they're not, then they're not, there's this asymmetry where they're not talking about what's really going on and what they're really worried about. And, um, you know, what's crappy about this is that the person who loses is, is the entrepreneur who goes all in, right? Right. Cause it's his capital that he's, or her capital that, that she's using, um, you know, our business is very similar to that too, in the sense that like, you know, we, we kind of go from, we oscillate between fear and greed, uh, when we're dealing with the human emotion or, in, in, when people are actually investing money. And it, you know, I think one of the, the best lessons you can learn as an entrepreneur, especially as an investor is everything is a cycle mm. and being able to acknowledge, I don't think you can perfectly know when the top of a market is maybe Bob, um, maybe that's why he's so confident and slightly delusional is because, uh, you know, he does believe those things. But, but I think understanding that like, hey, maybe we're closer to the end of this thing than the beginning of this thing. And we see this with tech right now. And you know, we talk a lot about big tech. We talk about some of the valuations right now and they look a lot like they did back in 2000 when the dot-com bubble burst. Um, so I think just having an understanding of like, okay, we're probably not at the end of it maybe, but we're probably a lot closer to the end than the beginning um, is probably like a very powerful acknowledgement. And I, I, I can see what you're saying. Probably a lot of entrepreneurs can't appreciate the, the quote unquote cycle. Yeah, I mean, I think I think one of the most dangerous mythologies around entrepreneurship and it filters down this. This has become a cultural like nationwide delusion that filters down to the dentists and the small business owners, the guys running like I mean, there's a lot of entrepreneurs out there running a couple of vans full of guys doing home repairs or electrician work or whatever who are killing it. They're creaming it. They're making a ton of money. And the, the, the cultural mythology, the, the Business Insider articles, the books that are written about entrepreneurship, all tell us the story of the lone wolf entrepreneur who's a master of the universe, who makes stuff happen through will, through willpower and is ultimately on the cause side of the cause effect equation of all things. And the reason that this happens is because no one clicks an article and no one buys a book that says, a good business is a product of riding a wave. You know, there's an aspect of luck involved. And so we're all being kind of fed this, this, this cultural delusion about how, you know, nothing but the, but the execution and strategy of the entrepreneur themselves matters. And it does, yeah, it does put people in this really weird, uh, in this really weird spot. I mean, I had a, I'll tell you guys a story. Like I worked with a guy years ago who, had a really great e-commerce exit, which was, you know, it was eight figures, sort of low eight figures, really nice nest egg. He had, uh, he had bootstrapped the company and had like vast majority of ownership. So just like a huge liquidity event, QSBS tax savings, like just nailed it, winning, winning at life. Right. And the way he bootstrapped this business was the way all bootstrappers bootstrap, which is he did everything himself in the beginning, super lean and mean, like every single expense was going through his, you know, like his credit card. He was like, do we really need this $29 piece of software? Like that kind of diligence. Right. On the other side of it, he took some time off and then was like, I want to do another business, but this time I'm going to do it right. And like this, this, <laughs> that, that is the most dangerous phrase you'll ever hear a second time founder ever say this time right. I'm going to do it right. Because what does that mean? It means that he was going. He's going to take all of the what worked last time and throw that out as compromises that he had to make because he was undercapitalized. Now he's rich. Now he's got money. So doing it right, man, making expensive executive hires from day <laughs> one, right, on this crazy business idea before they pre-revenue, you know, like pre even really having a product. Yeah. It meant like throwing all this cash in, building up this opex, and uh, you know, I watched this guy take. Uh, take an eight figure nest egg and just drain it into a new idea and end up, you know, selling real estate to at, at the end oh. of it to recoup his losses. And again, the, I think where does this come from psychologically? It's this story, it's this cultural 
mythology that we have that like it all starts with the entrepreneur and that's what creates the results. You know, we see that in every aspect of investing. You know, something I said the other week was that most investors don't invest for a bull market. They chase a bull market. And, you know, it's not just the entrepreneur that loses. You take the investors who put money into a private equity fund or into a venture capital fund and, you know, that they, they, they have to give it back if they can't find a, a good venture. So they convince the entrepreneur that, yeah, yeah, start another company. I got this money I got to give back. So we got to get it invested because they don't want to lose their fee or their commission. So the investor, you know, actually loses. And, and I see the same cycle on, you know, all the boards that I've served on investment boards where, you know, these committees, they would evaluate the performance of each aspect of the portfolio based on this three-year track record. And whatever was down over a three-year period, they would sell. And then what was up is when they take the loser and, it, and they invest it there. And they're, they're wondering, well, how can we never make any money? We're always selling down and, and you know, buying, you know, selling low and buying high. <laughs> um, it's human nature. I see it. I mean, I see it in every aspect of the investment experience I've had. And it's, um, you know, it's interesting to see that same thing happens with entrepreneurs. Yeah, it's kind of it goes back to, again, it's acknowledging there's a cycle because the, the other question is, is this person smart? Are they riding the wave, right? And yeah. I think that's what you have to discern between. And that's a great point because when whenever investors look at a track record, right, they look at who did the best over the last 10 years. Well, the next 10 years aren't going to look like the last 10 years. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest mistakes. I mean, when people go for their 401k options, right. they go up, they look at the track record. And right now it's like, let me put everything to a growth fund, a small cap growth fund, large cap growth fund. And meanwhile, you know, places like International, which have done nothing for like a decade, most likely are probably a better place to put the capital. But again, you know, investors, they, they go with the more short-sighted um, you know, view. And 10 years, let's face it, is not that long a time when you're talking about investing you know, in any sort of cycle. Yeah, I think, uh, I think, it, I think this, is the, like, this is really what, I'm, what I find is super fascinating about human nature in general, right? Is that we're, you know, we're patent spotting machines and we have this tendency like that's really what that's we that's what we evolved to do right, right. there's a and and you can see this i'm very interested in the idea of sort of paleo psychology i think you can understand most of human behavior and human nature by looking at like what made sense and was optimal for survival on the savanna right for our like ancestors 100 million years ago because we're kind of walking yeah. around wearing the same meat suit biologically identically <laughs> as the, those guys back on the African savannah, right? Yeah. And nothing's really changed in terms of our hardware. Crystal wears a bear skin around. Yeah. Right <laughs> so, uh, and, and, and one of the things that, you know, one of the things that's really helpful in that environment is being able to spot patterns, being able to, you know, being able to see things that, that jump out to you that correlate. And we see this in like, you know, we, we're trying to make meaning out of everything that happens to us. Like thunder isn't just a phenomenon. We're not, our ancestors aren't just like, oh, it's a loud noise in the sky. They're like, the gods are angry. What does this mean for me? Because every time I hear thunder, a little while later, there's a terrible flood and like, you know, my family old like people die and it's really bad. And so we start to, like we're, we're hardwired to look at phenomenon in the present and the recent past yeah. and then develop these theories about what's going to work in the future, right? And the problem is that the future is random and it does it doesn't necessarily always follow that pattern. So something that's been going up and up and up, we we that we cannot help. It's like hardwired into our biology to go, yeah, up and to the right, right? Like what what could stop this trend? Totally. And uh, and entrepreneurs, you know, do that exact same thing. Like it's you know, I uh, I think it's the same for investors. It's the same for the business owner who's watching sales in a you know, of a product go up and to the right and is think starts to starts to think to themselves like, I'm gonna take this thing to the moon. There's no there's no limit to how big this company <laughs> can be without really knowing that like there's gonna be a ceiling. You're gonna hit the total attainable market, right? Something's gonna change. And so yeah, I mean I think that's where this is just this is a human nature, right? Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning investing. This is what we do every single day. 
We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make, it's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. You know, and I guess another question is, so I know you do talk to a lot of entrepreneurs when they've had that liquidity event and a lot of times they'll sit down with you um, maybe to to get some sense of where they are, because it's like overwhelming when you've been bootstrapping, um, you know, the cash flow has been light and all of a sudden you've got this big chunk of money. Um, and then, you know, from your perspective, I mean, what do you, what do you say to somebody like that? What's the, what's kind of the, the, what's the, I guess what's really like their mindset at that time. And what's the mindset you want to get people into, um, you know, when they've had that big liquidity event, like, yeah, what does that look like? Yeah. So, it's a really good question. The thing about making a lot of money in a business is that it tends to happen really fast at the tail end of long a long period of struggle, right? Yes. So the way that you look the way that you look at like kind of W2 or let's say taxable earnings for a founder of a business is yeah, like that it tends to be that it's all at that, like it's a 10 year journey or seven year journey or whatever, and it all happens right at the end, right? Which is crazy. And yeah. that, that could be because they're a startup founder and they're selling a big software company to a big acquirer, or it could yeah. be because they've built a bootstrap cash flowing business where they're figuring out the model and they're tinkering and then they really nail customer acquisition and gross margin. And then at the end, it's like this company is now printing a couple million dollars in cash at the, you know, every every year or every month or whatever and that kind of happens towards that it's the tail end because that's when everything changes for the entrepreneur right that's when they start talking to people like you guys um, they start talking to somebody like me and so the thing that you've got to i think if you're in a position like this that you've got to think about is expectations because most yeah. entrepreneurs have had this moment in the very recent past of this hockey stick of earnings and again, we just talked about this, this pattern spotting thing where we look at these trajectories and go up and to the right, like how much more can I keep this going? And this is, I think, the first challenge entrepreneurs have is that they start to see the huge potential and go, how can I get more of this, right? So the expectations that develop at that liquidity event or that develop when that business is really printing money and cash flowing are the first place where our brain can just like hyper distort what's going on to what's going on and prevent us from seeing, I guess, from having close contact with observable reality, right? <laughs> so yes. a lot of times the entrepreneur kind of does this, like what sells a company and is like, wow, like that was easy. And I just turned this asset into let's say yeah. $20 million. And in that moment, they're probably thinking, I could do this again, like with everything I know now, just like that, right? And so that's where that temptation comes in to double down, to go back to the roulette table and be like, you know, like and play and play again. And so what I like to do when entrepreneurs have had one of these moments um, is sit down and talk to them about why they started the business in the first place, right? And to reconnect okay. with the values that ultimately drove them at the beginning because usually an entrepreneur gets started because they want freedom, right? They can't work for anybody else. They're pathologically unemployable. I can relate to that. Right. I know, I know Bob and Chris can too. <laughs> yeah. Or maybe they did, maybe they did have some definition of wealth that they wanted. They were like, they were in it to get rich. And it's really important to look at where they are now compared to where they wanted to be when they started versus compared to where they think they could probably be next year. <laughs> right, right. Already, a year, already a year or two because I mean I saw this in the in the crypto like the big crypto bull market uh, for you know a couple of years ago where there were entrepreneurs who were getting cash out of businesses and liquidity 
and they were crazy enough to be like uh, the, to, to have a strategy like a conscious strategy of i need to pull money out of my business because i can just put it into the magic money machine and, multi <laughs> and multiply it and it's really easy to be sat on 20 million dollars feel bulletproof right or i mean any amount insert any amount of money feel bulletproof and go what if i could just double this you know right and, and i think that's where people really start to lose control and so what i like to do is 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 return them back to like when you were kind of grounded at the start of this and you set off on this journey, what did you want to create for yourself? Because the first thing you should do post windfall is set up a totally bulletproof way to have that thing you originally wanted, whether it was freedom yes. or functional wealth, right? So that it can be never taken away. Then from there, we can start to talk about the campfire money, which is like, you know, what's the right amount to, what's what's the right amount to put in the YOLO fund? <laughs> and I think some entrepreneurs need that for their own sanity. They have to have, they have to be able to, I mean, they're addicted. They have to be able to go back and, and, and play the game to some degree, but you gotta get it, you gotta ground it in those expectations from the past first. Well, it sounds like you kind of take the same approach that we do when it comes to managing money. We, you know, we ask our clients what their goals are. What did they, what are they setting out to do? And we based a plan based on that. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think it's just, I think the crazy thing is just how much the goals can change yeah. and how quickly when there's a money yeah. printing, when there's a money printing moment where suddenly you know, you go from it. I mean, it, the hedonic treadmill kicks in, right? Like when you were seven years old, you would have killed for a Porsche 911, <laughs> and now Still. you're you're selling a you're selling a company, and then you're and now you're shopping at Ferrari, right? right and right. you're thinking like, what else can I do? Yeah. Well, it, it's funny though, actually, because it's we, we do these kind of projections. Chris made a good point to for for clients when they have a big liquidity event and stuff like that. A funny thing is, a lot of times their goals really haven't changed. You know, it's like maybe I want to. 10x my money but in reality when you look at their actual lifestyle and what they actually need it really hasn't changed that much it's kind of like that the effect of going to the cocktail party and it's like wait a second you know i just talked to my friend he has nvidia uh you know his money went up a thousand percent like what are we doing um but the irony is like their goals haven't changed so why are we looking to right. 10x your money take way more risk if that's not actually what you want, <laughs> just right. because you're at a cocktail party and you want to keep up the Joneses all of a sudden. And I, I think there's a difference between what you want when you're the best version of yourself, the most level-headed, <laughs> that, that neocortical front brain is super <laughs> engaged and you're really thinking why it's shrewdly yeah. versus like a few drinks in at that cocktail party yeah. version of yourself, which is some form of compromised, right? And some form of... Uh, of uh, mimetic desire based on your friend with the Nvidia stock where you're like, that could be me. And so I think that's the tricky thing to, to kind of tease out. And, and yeah, like business success puts people, uh, kind of makes people a big target for those types of psychological experiences of, you know, you suddenly start comparing. I mean, I, I, I remember working with entrepreneurs who, uh, an entrepreneur who sold a company where the diligence process and the, the, the process they ran with the acquirer where they got beat up and the price got pulled down and you know, like the acquirer poked holes in the business and was like, here's why we're not going to value it this way. And that, that fuel fueled him up with all of this kind of motivational rage where he was like, well, now I know how to build a business that will like, that will be super highly valued. And he sold the company for a lot of money, but he was like, I could see how to do it for more now. So I'm, I'm back in the game, baby. I'm going to do something else. And so that, you know, that type of thing can happen too. Sounds like so. me, Peter, that's just the concept of enough, right? You have to, you have to remind them or educate uh, anybody on, you know, what enough means. And I think the issue we run into is because we put these plans in writing and we review them every year and we adjust them for inflation and taxation so that, you know, the goals really never change. It's when they start changing the goalpost, right? Or they start reaching for higher goals suddenly. And I think, I think that's what you're referencing. And I, we, we see that happening with people all the time, as, as you obviously do. You know, when people are trying to sell a company or build a, a new perfect company. Yeah. The perfect company. That's also a very expensive <laughs> sentence, right? <laughs> Doing it. We're going to do it. Do it. Going to do it perfectly this time. Anyone who does software development and feels that drive for perfection is about to lose a lot of money. Um, <laughs> the, I, yeah, I totally agree. I think that, um, I think that it's very like, a, I'm sort of disparaging entrepreneurs a little bit in this chat, but I, I think that there is a way to do it right, which is to 
tr like I think entrepreneurs, the reason that they do get there, and it's, it isn't all just luck. There is some, there is being smart, there is being motivated and being, you know, executing really well. I think it's important that they do have optimism and this drive for upward mobility. What I think super critical is that entrepreneurs look at life and look at building businesses as kind of climbing this ladder to different levels and that they kind of get off and make a little hay while the sun shines before they get back on, right? Like you don't want to climb the ladder without ever really taking, you know, without ever really getting off and kind of enjoying and being like, oh, this is what life is like at this level. You know what I mean? So I think, uh, I think getting, you know, getting entrepreneurs to think about what is the, what's the nest egg? What's the investing strategy that makes sense yes. for me to put in place and then I'm going to take my time and that smart brain that I was just convincing myself created all this value and go work on something else with the discipline of kind of leaving behind me like, a, you know, the wealth that that I've actually like I've actually acquired rather than just continuing to kind of go all in. Peter, are there incurable are there incurable serial entrepreneurs? Because I've spoken to some that, you know, they're there. Right. And, you know, I wanted to create multi-generational wealth for my family. You've done that. Yeah. But I wanted to get to, yeah, but you're there. Um, do they, is there any way to communicate to somebody that they don't have to keep growing, keep striving? Um, or, or, or are some people just incurable? I look, and I, I think, I, yeah, I think there, I think there are people who are just hardwired this way. And I think that I also think that there's some other things going on there psychologically. I've worked with clients like this. I mean, I've worked with a guy who, um, who is perpetually frustrated that, that the business isn't on a trajectory to be at a, and he's, you know, multiple ventures isn't on a trajectory to produce a billion dollar outcome for him personally. <laughs> and that's like, you know, he's got investors. Yeah. And so even a billion dollar market cap doesn't mean a billion dollars for him. Right. So he's, he's got this right. crazy drive and he'll be the first to admit that when he gets there, he's going to be totally miserable. Like he's going to be like, what's next? Like now, you know, how can like, there's nothing worse than being in the billionaire club as a lowly just scraped by 1 billion. Right. Like, <laughs> do you even have a yacht? Yeah. You know, like, like that's not he, he he kind of is aware of that and he sort of says that smilingly like i know i'm not going to be happy but he's sort of resigned to this anyway yes but i think i think what's going on you got to look at the full context of people like this my experience of entrepreneurs who are driven this way is that they derive a lot of satisfaction from playing the game right the game of business is like it's chess to them it's video games like they don't they don't enjoy they don't really have other hobbies because for them, this is where they, this is where they find that kind of fulfillment. And I think it's, it's their identity too, right? I think some of it's maybe it's not even out of happiness. It's out of ego and identity. It's like, if I don't do this, then what am I? Right. And I think I find this too, like, you know, with different echelons of wealth is you start hanging out with different people and those people have even more wealth than the last group of people you hung out with. And because we're humans, we don't deal in absolutes. It's not like, well, I'm way up on the food chain. It's just like relative to these other people, um, you know, I, I'm here, but I want to be here. And I think that happens to a lot of people when they create wealth in life. It's just like you never feel any better because now you're in a different echelon of people that are doing better than you. So you feel just like you did when you didn't have as much money because you're still the low man on the totem pole in that like segment of society that you're in. Absolutely. Yeah. The, I mean, the hedonic treadmill is real in that sense and the sort of treadmill of comparison. I also think there's another thing going on on a positive side or well, I see this as a positive, which is you, if you, like, if you do have a liquidity event, if you sell a business, there's this, you go on vacation, right? Like everyone's like, take the big trip. You go somewhere tropical and you enjoy it. And then you come back and there's this creeping realization that you're no longer in the arena. And I've dealt yes. with a lot of entrepreneurs who feel this way, um, where there used to be, their phone used to be going off the hook. There were inbound text messages all day and they would be overwhelmed by that on a bad day and like feeling really busy. But the absence of that entirely can sometimes be very jarring. It's a very disconcerting feeling of, you know, it doesn't take long for your networks to kind of start to evaporate because everybody else is still playing the game and trying to, you know, get their get their payday, right? Everybody yes. moves on. Six months later, no one's really talking to you anymore. You're not really working on anything. And I think it's so easy for entrepreneurs to kind of go, what is life without this? I need to, I want to be important again. I want to feel like I matter. Yeah. And when all of your social relationships are built around the business that you're doing with people, <laughs> if you remove 
doing business with people, suddenly you're socially isolated. And, you know, this is one of the most, like social connection is one of the most motivating and important, important aspects of the human psyche. We are, we're social primates. We're hardwired to benefit from and also crave that connection to others. And if your whole life is, your whole world is built around business, if you just, if you remove that, you, you, you smartly negotiate the ultimate no golden handcuff deal because you play off two acquirers against one another. You're a genius. And then you wake up one day with a fat wire that hit your account. Your financial plan is really happy. And you're like, <laughs> yes, they are. What, what, what am I going to do today? Um, and maybe just a final question. We asked this to all our guests. Um, so if there's one song or album that you heard when the first time you heard it, uh, it completely changed your view of the world. What song or album was that? Oh man, I'm unprepared for this. That's a heavy one. <laughs> yeah, we try not to <laughs> preempt it. One song or album that completely changed my view on the world. I'm gonna go to the time that if, in my life when one song or album could completely change my view on the world, my young teenage impressionable years. And I'm gonna Perfect. say the track 46 and two by Tool. A little bit of progressive wow. now. Wow, I have yeah. not have seen you as a, uh, yeah. a Tool fan. That's, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I can't, I mean, I, I don't know what, if I can really elaborate on it, but I remember hitting those lyrics, hitting the, hitting those, hitting that, uh, that heavy kind of prog metal vibe, <laughs> and like having my, uh, having my third eye squeegeed open, circa like age seventeen or something like that. We could see you in some goth gear, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> rocking out in uh, in New Zealand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a great. That's a great surprise question. I love it. Now it's always a dangerous question, you know, on uh, Peter because Ryan is a is a music <laughs> snob, so he, he did really well. I wouldn't dare to try yeah. to suggest I could impress him, but I knew I could yeah. surprise him. I'm just uncomfortable now. I think you know anyone who listens to Tool, you gotta certainly yes, yeah, I can guess. You know, yeah, Any, uh, yeah. Anything you've said this whole podcast. Yeah, no, that was Peter. great. Thank you very much for uh, taking the time, man. This is awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. It's been super fun. Yeah. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Pain Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 